Beauty and the Beast, I think, is the best Disney film, all things considered. Oh. It's it's very witty. It's yeah. I like the music. It's it doesn't moralize. <laughs> a great female hero. It's it is an investigation into ideal femininity and the redemptive power of femininity. And then one of the things that's so subtle about Beauty and the Beast is that you have Gaston, mm -hmm. and Gaston isn't a monster, but he is, which is why Beauty doesn't like him. He's got everything. He's tall, and he sings that. I've got everything. Look at me. I'm tall. I'm handsome. I'm strong. I'm brave. He's all persona. Uh -huh. Like, he's all surface. And he isn't the monster, because the beast is the monster. But the beast is real, and Beauty can see that. And she turns away from the narcissistic persona and pursues the redeemable beast. And if you don't understand, if you don't see that that's how human beings interact with each other, you're not looking. And women are, that and the woman wants the redeemable beast because the redeemable beast has the virtues of the beast. And if you want someone to protect you and your infants from beasts, you need someone with the virtue of the beast. But he has to be redeemed because as a beast, he's a beast. That's no, you want a beast in your house? It's like, no, it's not, that's not good. He has to be, he has to be civilized beast. That's what I'm encouraging young men to be, civilized beasts. Do you remember your process of integrating your shadow? Oh, definitely. I definitely remember that. Tom, oh, I think the best practice is to, is to try to not lie, try to stop lying. Listen to your words. Listen, feel them, feel them. Are they the right words? Do you believe this? Do you believe what you're saying? Is it true as far as you're concerned? And then you might find that you have something true to say, but you're afraid to. Okay, then there, there's a place for integration of the shadow because hopefully you can be monstrous enough to say what you believe to be true. And so that means there's a combativeness in some sense in that. And so if you can't do that, so maybe you don't say what's true because you want to look, you want to be a persona, you want to you want to be nice, you want to appeal to people, you want to be popular, whatever, whatever it is yeah. you're pursuing. Yeah. You're going to do it in a manipulative way and, and you subjugate your truth to that. That's not helpful. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, well, you're pursuing the road of Gaston in some sense. I mean, he's popular in the village and... You know, he's got a mob behind him mm -hmm. and what's not to like? And that's what he says. Yeah. But beauty is, she's wiser than that. I started paying attention to how my words made me feel mm -hmm. psychologically when I was about 23. Mm -hmm. I really started to pay attention. And I learned, I learned that that was worth paying attention to. And I swore that I would strive to say, to not lie to not lie, to say what I believe to be the case. And so that was part of the reason why my lectures were popular, say at Harvard and then at the University of Toronto. And before this explosion of notoriety, there was some movement in that direction. I had posted my Maps of Meaning lectures online. That TV station in Toronto had done a 13 part series on the Maps of Meaning course because really because of the somewhat remarkable student response to the course, you know, because the mm -hmm. typical response to when in the student evaluations, the typical comment was this course changed the way I look at everything. When and if and when tragedy strikes, either of us, I hope that one of us is standing when it blows past. And and that there's a harshness about that that's unbelievably cruel because you know you say, well, if my mother died, I could live. Well what kind of monster are you exactly? The death of your mother doesn't do you in. Well, it turns out that being a monster is the right thing. So, and that's a rough thing to learn, but it's necessary to learn, you know, because it also makes you, you know, at some point, for example, as you get older, by the time you're in your mid twenties, something like that, you should start having a relationship with your parents that's approximately one of peers. And you can tell if you have that. So here's a little trick you can use. So you have parents, obviously, they have friends. You probably care what your parents think, I would imagine. Do you care what their friends think of you? And the answer to that is, well, not nearly as much. And so then I would say, well, why do you care what your parents think of you then? They're the same people. You know what I mean? It's just luck of the draw that your parents are someone else's kids' friends. They don't think the same way about them that you do. Well, that's where you see that you have a projection, right? If by the time you're 30, if what your parents think of you matters more than what, say, a random set of their friends think of you, 
then you've still got your parents confused with, with God. That's one way of looking at it. You've still got them confused with an archetype and you're still a child. And you might think, well, it's pretty damn rude not to think about what your parents think of you anymore, not to care. It's like, yeah, it's kind of rude, but maybe you'll be useful for them when they get old. And that's a much better form of caring. It's like you're going to be independent enough and strong enough and, and detached enough so that when the, when, the, when the power dynamic shifts, which it will, that you'll be the person that can carry things forward. Well, you can't do a better thing for them than that, right? That's the best of all possible outcomes for your parents. Sisyphus, and Nietzsche said of Sisyphus, if I remember correctly, that one has to imagine him happy. Well, if there's a rock at the bottom of the hill, then you might as well push it up the hill. And if it rolls back down, well, then you've got something else to do, don't you? You can push the damn rock back up the hill. And there's no shortage of rocks to put up, to push up the hill. And that's what we're built for anyways. And so let's go out and like push some damn boulders up the hill. And then maybe we could have enough self-confidence and enough enough respect for ourselves that we wouldn't have to turn to hatred and revenge and try to take everything down because I think that's the alternative. So he's not weak, that's one thing you can say. The same idea represented there, right? That's Atlas who voluntarily takes the world on his shoulders. It's like the idea of Christ taking the sins of the worlds on his shoulders. Exactly the same notion, which is the notion that you should be able to recognize in yourself all the horror of humanity and take responsibility because that's what that means. And the thing that's so interesting about that is that if you can recognize yourself in yourself, all the horror of humanity, you will instantly have a hell of a lot more respect for yourself than you did before you did that. Because there's some real utility in knowing that you're a monster. Now, and just because you're a monster doesn't mean you have to be a monster, but it's really useful to know that you are one. So, and, and I, one of the things that Jung knew, and this is something that I, I find so amazing about his writings, I think something that really distinguishes him, for example, from Joseph Campbell, who talked about following your bliss, is like Jung said very clearly that the first step to enlightenment is the encounter with the shadow. And what he meant by that was everything horrible that human beings have done was done by human beings. You're one of them. And so if you don't understand that, and to understand that really means to know how it was that you could have done it. And that's a shattery thing. To try to imagine that, to try to imagine yourself as someone who is engaged in medieval torture, to see how you could in fact do that. You're never the same after you learn that. But being never the same after learning that is unbelievably useful because when you understand that that's what you're like, then you're a whole different creature. And I don't think, and this is something I did learn from Jung, is that you cannot be a good person until you know how much evil you contain within you. It is not possible. And it's partly because you just don't have any potency. Like, if you're just naive, if you're just nice, if you'd never hurt anyone, you'd never hurt a fly, you don't have the capability for any of that, why would anyone ever take you seriously? You're, you're just, you're a domestic animal advocate. And it's a very strange thing because you wouldn't think that the revelation of the capacity for evil is a precondition for the realization of good. But I believe it, first of all, why would you be serious enough to even attempt to pursue the good unless you had some sense of what the consequence was of not doing it. You, you have to be serious about these sorts of things. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not the game of a child, right? It's the game of a fully developed adult. And you have, I learned this in part when I had little kids. I, I wrote a chapter for my new book called Never Let Your Children Do Anything That Makes You Dislike Them. And why was that? And I read, I read that, wrote that after I knew I was a monster. And I thought, I'm gonna make sure I like my kid. I'm going to make sure they behave around me so that I like them because I'm way bigger than them and I'm way more cruel than they are and I've got tricks up my sleeve that they cannot even possibly imagine and if if they irritate I will absolutely take it out on them and if you don't think that you're the sort of person that would do that then you are the sort of person who is doing it